Hi, welcome to a lecture on the potential induced in a dipole. The problem addressed in this lecture is the one shown in this figure on the left. And specifically, what we have is an incident plane wave expressed in terms of the electric field intensity, indicated here as E super I. And what we're interested in is the induced open circuit potential, that is, the voltage created across the terminals of the dipole here in response to that electric field. And we're going to call that V sub OC. The answer to this problem has many applications in antenna engineering. And specifically here, it's going to lead to the concept of vector effective length, which is applicable to all kinds of antennas. So even though the title implies that the scope of this lecture is limited to a dipole, we will find that this is easily generalizable to all kinds of antennas. A direct attack on this problem involves solving Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations, in this case, four partial differential equations, and then associated boundary conditions describing what's happening on the dipole. And you can solve those, eventually leading to an expression for V sub OC. However, that technique is relatively difficult you can get to the same answer relatively quickly using the concept of reciprocity. Reciprocity is explained in a different lecture, and if you haven't seen that lecture yet or you aren't already familiar with reciprocity, you should take a few moments to review the concept. Generally, reciprocity means comparing two distinct scenarios that manifest within the same linear time invariant system. For the present problem, we will define two scenarios that we can then use to compare and derive a result. The first scenario is scenario 1, shown here in the figure on the left, in which we have the dipole, which was described at the beginning of this lecture, and it's radiating an electric field. So we have applied a current to the terminals. In response, we get a radiated electric field intensity which we call E sub 1, given by this expression. The trick is simply to align a whole bunch of current moments and then simply integrate over them for whatever distribution of current magnitude you care to choose. So for example, for a half-wave dipole, this would be a sinusoidal pulse, zero at the ends and maximum at the middle. For the purposes of our derivation here, the details of that current distribution are not going to matter only that it fits this model. And then the far field, we have a Hertzian dipole. And a Hertzian dipole is just a very, very short dipole. In fact, it's the shortest imaginable dipole. And we're going to measure the voltage, the potential induced across the terminals of that Hertzian dipole. We'll call that V sub 2 super R. So the subscript 1 is referring to the dipole of interest. The subscript 2 here is referring to the Hertzian dipole. Now the key is that a Hertzian dipole is so short that the induced potential depends only on the geometry of the terminals. In other words, if you don't have that much metal, or you have a vanishingly small amount of metal, you have only terminals. In this case, it's pretty simple to compute the potential. You don't even need any of the other results we're going to derive here. We find that the potential induced across the terminals of the Hertzian dipole, is given by basic electromagnetics. Specifically, you just take the electric field intensity in the gap, and you integrate over length, and then you have a minus sign. That's it. You can find this in any basic textbook on electromagnetics. The trick is to know what the electric field intensity in the gap is. Well, here we have negligible structure. This is why we chose a Hertzian dipole. When we have negligible structure, the electric field in the gap is equal to the instant electric field. And the gap is vanishingly small, so the integral becomes simply minus sign, electric field intensity evaluated at the location of the Hertzian dipole, which we're calling R sub 2, dot product, with the orientation of the Hertzian dipole. What I didn't mention earlier is that the Hertzian dipole is aligned this way. This direction is theta hat, corresponding to this being z hat. And then we have delta L, which is just the length of the Hertzian dipole, which is vanishingly short, 
and in the final analysis will not make a difference. So, for scenario one, we find that the potential induced in the Hertzian dipole in this situation is given simply by minus j, 8 over 2, spherical wave, phase and magnitude, pattern factor of the transmitting dipole, sine theta, and then this expression pertaining to the current distribution times delta L. Now I'll point out that this is a rare situation in which we are able to directly calculate the induced potential. And that's what makes this useful in reciprocity analysis, is having that handle provided by the fact that we can compute the potential across the terminals of a Hertzian dipole. So now we move on to scenario two. We always need two scenarios to employ a reciprocity argument. In the second scenario, shown currently on the left side of the screen, we once again have the dipole of interest, and we once again have the Hertzian dipole in the far field aligned again in the theta hat direction. But this time, the Hertzian dipole is transmitting, and it's creating an electric field intensity E sub 2. And that electric field intensity E sub 2 arrives at the dipole and creates the potential that we're interested in. So, the Hertzian dipole is driven by current, I sub 2, and we'll use the superscript T here to identify the precise scenario. And the dipole of interest sees V sub 1 super R in response. So as before, we need to determine the electric field intensity at the terminals that we're interested in. Here, that's E sub 2, the field transmit by the Hertzian dipole, at the origin, because that's where the terminals of interest are. And that's given by the current moment expression. This is because a Hertzian dipole on transmit is essentially equivalent to a zero-length current moment. And we already know what the expression for the electric field intensity radiated by a very short current moment is. It's simply given in this case by this expression, theta hat, j, eta, i sub 2t, beta times delta l over 4 pi, and here's the spherical wave phase and magnitude. And this part here would normally be sine theta, but it's equal to 1 here. And the reason it's equal to 1 is because theta in this particular case, is 90 degrees from the axis. So we can just go ahead and put a 1 in here. Now, V1 super R is a scalar, whereas E sub 2 at the terminals is a vector. And somehow we need to get from that vector to the scalar potential. Well, we know that the magnitude of the potential created across the terminals has to be proportional to the magnitude of the electric field intensity. There are many ways to see this. One way to see it is simply to note that potential is volts. Electric field intensity is volts per meter. So clearly these are going to be proportional in magnitude. So it's reasonable to relate these two quantities, the potential and the instant electric field intensity, as follows. What we say is that V sub 1 super R must be equal to the stimulus, which is the instant electric field, dot product, the dot product reducing a vector quantity to a scalar quantity, some vector. And we're not going to say what that vector is quite yet. We're going to figure it out using reciprocity. But that vector will have a magnitude. We'll call that L sub E. And it will have a direction, L hat. Now, there are an infinite number of ways that we could choose L sub E and L hat. There are an infinite number of ways that we can reduce the vector quantity of the electric field intensity to the scalar quantity of the potential that we seek. An infinite number of ways to do this. So we have freedom to choose what we're going to use to define this quantity, L sub e, the vector. There are two choices that have convenient physical interpretations, and I'm going to show you one that is the most common one. Here, we're going to choose L hat, the direction of that vector, to correspond to the reference direction or polarization of the electric field intensity in these scenarios. That direction is theta hat. Now, I'm going to make L hat minus theta hat, and that minus sign seems arbitrary, and it is. 
Why am I throwing it in there? Well, there's two ways you can see this. One way is you can just view this as an arbitrary choice, which conveniently eliminates a minus sign later in the derivation. And that's not wrong. However, if you insist on a physical interpretation, I would offer this. On receive, positive V sub 1 super R implies current flow in the minus z hat direction. That is, if this quantity is positive, then I expect to see current flow this way. And that's opposite the sense of the current flow in the definition of the electric field that we've established previously. So we would expect that E1 in response is in the minus theta hat direction. So either one of those two interpretations is fine. In the final analysis, it doesn't really matter what explanation you apply to this. It's the one we're going to use. And we have the freedom to choose. So continuing, we have that V sub 1 super R is the electric field intensity incident on the dipole's terminals, dot product with this vector L sub E that we're defining. And we've established the direction of this vector, minus theta hat. So we go ahead and plug that in there. And then we can apply the rest of the expression. Theta hat dot theta hat is 1. So now we have a scalar. And here's our scalar. At this point, we're ready to apply reciprocity. And in terms of the variables that we've developed here for these two scenarios, the relevant form of reciprocity is simply I sub 1 super T, V sub 1 super R equals I sub 2 super T, V sub 2 super R. That is reciprocity applied to this scenario in terms of the variables that we've developed here. So V sub 1 super R, the quantity we seek, is the ratio of these two currents, remember those are for different scenarios, times V sub 2 super R. And we have the expression for V sub 2 super R from scenario 1. We go ahead and substitute that. We get this expression. Now on the left, we can substitute an expression for V sub 1 super R, the one we got up here, and eliminate the common factors, and we get this expression. Where on the left, we have Beta, the phase propagation constant, divided by 2 pi times L sub E. We don't yet know what L sub E is, but it looks like we're going to be able to solve for it. To do this, first note that beta equals 2 pi over lambda. So beta divided by 2 pi is just 1 over lambda. And that's going to cancel the like factor on the right here, this one here. So we were able to solve for L sub E. L sub E is this integral times sine theta. The sine theta came from the transmit pattern of the dipole. That's where that emerged from. The integral is an integration over the current on the dipole when the terminal current, that is I sub 1 super T, is equal to the maximum current in the distribution. So in other words, we can apply I sub 1 super T we'll get some distribution, i as a function of z, and in that case, the current at the origin is equal to the applied current at the terminals. So the experiment will be, or the method will be, to apply this current, see what the current distribution is as a result, do the integral, and we get this. Now you might wonder about this leading factor of 1 over i sub 1 super t. That's simply normalizing the result of the integral. That makes this integral independent of the current that we applied to the terminals. So we see here, L sub E, that magnitude, does not depend on the applied current. It depends only on the functional form of the resulting current distribution. If we double the current at the terminals, we get the same effective length. So this quantity is describing something fundamental about the geometry. It's not really saying anything about the magnitude of the source applied to the terminals. So in summary, what we have found here is that the open circuit voltage, which we were calling V sub 1 super R, but we might as well now recognize that it's open circuit voltage that we seek, is equal to the instant electric field, which we were calling 
e sub 2 at the origin, but we might as well just now I realize that this is e super i, dot this quantity, the vector L sub e, where that vector L sub e is equal to L hat, which we have defined to be minus theta hat. And then the magnitude L sub e, which is given by the above expression, that is this one right here. And to summarize, to calculate that magnitude, we apply some current, I sub 1 super t. doesn't matter what its magnitude is because it'll end up being normalized out. We determine what the current along the dipole is in response. Now, I'll tell you, this is actually the hard part and the part that we have glossed over here. In general, this requires some work to determine, but for simple structures, like electrically short dipoles, half-wave dipoles, it's pretty easy to figure out what that should be. Even for certain patches and certain other antennas, it's easy to know what that is. For more complicated structures, this part, step two, requires some more work. Typically requires something like a full-wave solver. Next, you integrate over the current distribution that you determined in the previous step. That integral will depend on theta, so the result may be a function of theta as well. You normalize by the applied current, which makes the initial current magnitude irrelevant, and you obtain this quantity, which depends only on the geometry of the antenna. Then you multiply by sine theta. So the plain English summary is as follows. The potential induced by a plane wave incident on a dipole is equal to the copolarized component of the instant electric field intensity times the normalized integral of the transmit current distribution times sine theta. That's the answer to the question posed at the beginning of this lecture. So now let's look at this quantity that we have obtained, L sub e the vector. We refer to this as vector effective length where the scalar part is just referred to as effective length, and you will see from dimensional analysis that L sub e has units of meters. So that when you take the dot product of the vector effective length with the electric field intensity, you get volts per meter for electric field intensity times meters for vector effective length gives you volts, which are the units of the potential across the uh, terminals. Now note that the way we defined this is not unique, but is common. And, and I would say perhaps even standard. There's at least one other way to define vector effective length, which is different, and as a result can be very confusing. The alternative method for defining vector effective length makes the direction of the vector effective length parallel to the axis of the dipole. So just making you aware that there is at least one other way of defining this. By the way, I'll point out that there is also an associated concept known as the antenna factor which is commonly used in electromagnetic compatibility work. The antenna factor is usually just the magnitude of the effective length. Here is an example, finding the potential induced in an electrically short dipole, which I'll abbreviate with uh, the acronym ESD, electrically short dipole. This electrically short dipole is aligned along the z-axis. The terminals are at the origin, and the current distribution, which we'll need to do this analysis, is shown here as this graph, which is a function of z along the vertical axis and magnitude of the current along the horizontal axis. For an electrically short dipole, the current goes to zero at the ends of the dipole, as it does for any dipole, but it goes linearly to a maximum at the terminals and then back down to zero. So an electrically short dipole has a very simple current distribution, which just goes from zero at the ends to a maximum uh, at the terminals. And you can write that down as a function by saying I is a function of Z is simply E1 super T, the applied current, times one minus two over L times the magnitude of Z. That's simply a clever way to get a triangle function that looks like this. And this is the current distribution you'll get for a dipole when the length of the dipole is much, much less than a wavelength, i.e. electrically short. 
So if we want the potential at the terminals, V sub OC, the first step is to find the effective length. Using the expression we've derived, we know it's sine theta times this integral. And we know what i as a function of z is inside the integral. This phase function is quite simple to do in this case. And the reason is because beta times z is simple. That is, beta times z is 2 pi over lambda times z. And we can rearrange factors a little bit here to get 2 pi times z over lambda. Well, if this thing is electrically short, that is, L is much, much less than lambda, then this quantity, z over lambda, is always going to be much, much less than 1. So the quantity 2 pi times z over lambda is always going to be much, much less than 2 pi. And if beta times z is always much, much less than 2 pi, then the argument of this complex exponential is always going to be much, much less than 2 pi, which means that this whole thing is always going to be approximately 1 with a phase of 0. Not exactly that, but it's going to be really, really close to Ej0 for the phase. So it effectively becomes a constant. So what we're left with is an integral that looks like this, where we've substituted back in the functional form of the current distribution. The i sub 1 t's cancel out, as they must, because this effective length can't depend on the actual stimulus. It's a function only the geometry of the array. And so we find that the magnitude of the effective length is simply the length of the dipole divided by 2 times sine theta. And this should not be surprising. That sine theta pertains to the transmit pattern of this dipole. And the divided by 2 part has to do with the fact that the area under the curve here is one half the area computed on a base time height basis. That's all that factor of 2 is referring to. Now, as explained earlier, L hat is minus theta hat. We've used the same coordinate system. So the vector effective length is simply minus theta hat times L over 2 times sine theta. So now we can calculate the potential, that is the voltage, induced by an instant plane wave. In this case, I will arbitrarily choose, just for the purpose of example, an angle of incidence pi over 4, meaning that the plane wave arrives at an angle of pi over 4 radians with respect to the z-axis, as shown here. E super i is going to be theta hat e sub naught, just a plane wave. Evaluate at the origin, which is the only place where we really need to have a value. The open circuit voltage, then, is the dot product of the instant electric field intensity and the effective length. So making those substitutions here, there's the electric field intensity, there is the vector effective length, and we find that the potential induced is minus E naught times L divided by 2 times sine pi over 4. That's all there is to it. Note that this is dimensionally correct. In other words, volts per meter times meters gives you volts. And furthermore, note that the magnitude of this thing depends on the angle of arrival. So if the angle of arrival were broadside, this would be bigger. And if the angle of arrival were along the axis, this would go to zero. So if you had to plane wave those instant from the direction along the axis, it'd be sine of zero and you get zero here. So you see the transmit pattern is reflected in the value of the induced potential. Now here's a second case. What happens if, instead of being copolarized, the instant electric field is cross-polarized? In other words, polarized in the phi hat direction as opposed to the theta hat direction. Well, in that case, we immediately know that the open circuit voltage induced will be zero. And the reason is because the dot product of the polarization of the instant electric field with the polarization of the dipole is zero. So here we're starting to see hints of what is casually or commonly said to be reciprocity. That is, when intended people talk about reciprocity, they often, maybe even usually, mean the existence of a received pattern, which has to do with the open circuit voltage magnitude and phase, which seems to have the same functional dependence as the transmit pattern. In other words, here, proportional to sine theta.
Also note that the open circuit potential is proportional to the length. Here, this is true for electrically short dipoles. As the dipole gets longer, the current distribution changes, and this may no longer be true. But for electrically short dipoles, up to dipoles which are about a half wavelength long, this relationship is true, that the open circuit voltage is at least approximately proportional to the length of the dipole. And you could probably anticipate this, right? A longer dipole should create a larger terminal voltage, at least up to some point. And I'll tell you that point is just a little bit beyond a half wavelength. The concepts of effective length, vector effective length, and the concept of open circuit voltage being this dot product of the instant electric field and the vector effective length, these concepts apply generally, that is to all kinds of antennas. In principle, all you need to know is the current distribution on transmit, and the procedure I've shown you above will give you the vector effective length. Really, the hard part is getting the transmit current distribution. For anything more complicated than dipoles or simple patches or things of that nature, typically you need a full wave solver to get that current distribution. I'll point out that you could alternatively get the vector effective length by measurement. That is, since you know the relationship between open circuit voltage and vector effective length, you could apply an instant electric field and then see what you get for an open circuit voltage and use that as a method to solve for the vector effective length. That concludes this lecture on the potential induced in a dipole.